Welcome to this new lecture of Math S400, Mathematics and Economic Modeling. In this lecture, we're going to define the concept of a correspondence. And as you will see, correspondence is like a generalization of a function, which we have seen before. We're going to see how we can extend the notion of continuity of a function towards continuity of a correspondence. And in particular, continuity uh, can be expanded in different in various way to correspondences but we will focus on two popular ones which is upper heme continuity and lower heme continuity so let me go to the whiteboard so remember a function f was from some domain and uh, mapped to another domain not a domain or a set r Okay, so if you take a vector x and d, then f of x gives you an element in R. Okay, so we would like to generalize this concept such that the object still takes something in the domain, but doesn't give a single value in the range, but basically can give a subset in the range. Okay, so we will define a correspondence, and I will use capital letters for correspondences, to be something from a domain to a range, and I will use two arrows instead of one to denote the correspondence to R, such that if we have x in the domain, then f of x is not an element in R, but is a subset of R. Okay, so in a correspondence in f of x, you can have multiple elements, whereas if you have a function, you can only have a single element. So this is a function, and this is a correspondence. Okay, so in general, if we depict functions, then we say that the domain is somewhere on the x-axis, and the function value uh, is somewhere here. So for every x in the domain, we have a unique value of the function. Correspondence, on the other hand, for every x here, you can have multiple values in the range, right? So this can be an entire subset. So in particular, we could have something that looks like, like this. So for any x here, we have multiple values in the range. Okay, so the correspondence could be this region in two-dimensional space. So correspondences can take a lot of different shapes. So for example, you could have the, the shape where for some x here, this f of x only contains a single element in the range. Okay, sorry. So for some values of x, f of x, which is a subset of R, only contains a single element, right? So this is now a set containing a single element. And then it could, for example, open up and it could collapse down to a single element again, and so on and so on, right? So basically, you can have uh, many various correspondences strange, with very strange shapes if you depict them in a two-dimensional uh, plane. Okay. So if we have a correspondence f that goes from some domain to some range. Okay, we can depict the graph of f. The graph of f are all the vectors x and vectors y, where x is in d and y is in r. Okay, so this is like a origin destination. I should have two arrows here. Origin destination couple, such that y is in f of x. Okay, so the set of all these pairs, you can call them inputs and outputs, such that the output is in f of the input. This is called the graph of f. So the graph of f here, you can see this as this is the set, right? So inputs, outputs, x's and y's, such that y is in f of x. So it's basically this set here which uh, makes up this picture this black uh, picture 
Okay, so here the graph is this entire arched uh, region. Okay, so this is a notion that's uh, quite important, the graph of a correspondence. So let me give another example which comes more from economics. So previously, uh, recall that we saw the budget set. Okay, so budget set was a set of uh, bundles Q and R K plus such that the inner product of P times Q is less or equal to the total expenditure uh, that we can make. So we can see this as a correspondence where, where P and M are the inputs of the correspondence, right? And what you get out of it is a subset of RK, right? All the bundles that satisfy this condition. Okay, so in this sense, you can see B as a correspondence that takes an element, it takes a price, right? So it goes from RK plus plus, all strict positive prices, times all strict positive uh, incomes, and it gives you a subset of RK plus. Okay, so this is the correspondence that we will use as a running example through, uh, through this lecture. So we're going to generalize the idea of continuity uh, that we have already seen from functions, and we're going to define something that's called continuity of a correspondence. In particular, we're going to see two kinds of continuity, and the first is called upper hemi continuity. Okay, and the definition of upper hemi continuity is a uh, is a bit long, right? But I will take you through it uh, step by step. Okay, so we have a correspondence f that goes from a domain to some range, right? So these can be vectors and these can be vectors. Okay, is upper hemi continuity continuous, and I will abbreviate it as UHC at x in the domain if the following conditions are satisfied. Okay, so first of all, for all sequences x n in D that converge to x, okay, and for all sequences y n and r such that for all n y n is equal to f of x n if y n converges to some vector y then y is in f of x and this x is, is here okay so that's the first thing and then there is the second part of the definition which says that for all sequences xn, n and n, in the domain, if xn converges to x, and for all sequences yn, n and n, in R, says that for all n, yn, is, this should not be equal, but it should be uh, an element, yn is n, f of x n, then the sequence y n is bounded. Okay, so there exists a number such that the norm of every element here is lower or equal to this number. This means we call uh, bounded. Okay, so let's go back to the first part. So we take any sequence that converges to x in the domain and we take any sequence of y's such that yn is an f of xn. Okay, so we have a sequence of x's. Each one, we can look at the image under uh, this correspondence of this particular xn, right? And for every xn, we take an element out of this set. Okay, then if it would turn out that these yn's converge to some y, well, then this limiting y should be an f of this uh, 
convergent element of the sequence exiting. Okay, so that's the notion. So in general, let's draw a picture, right? So we have a sequence x1, x2, x3, and so on. This converges to x. That's this first line here. And then we take a y1 in the uh, f of x1, we take a y2 in f of x2. Okay, so let's assume that this is the correspondence, right? So we take a y1 out of this range, we take a y2 out of this range, we take a y3 out of this range. So if it would happen that this sequence of y's converges to some y here, then this y should be in f of x. Okay, so that's uh, the first condition. And then the second condition, for any sequence x ends that converges to x, and any sequence y ends in this image set, this has to be bounded, so it's impossible that this sequence goes to infinity, either plus infinity or minus infinity, if you look at this uh, picture. So let's look at an example of a correspondence that is upper hemicontinuous, for example, such correspondence here. Okay, this is f. So for example, we can take an x in the set, and then for any sequence x and anything in the correspondence that converges, the limit also has to be in f of x. Okay, so that's the idea of the correspondence. And also anything in this correspondence cannot go to plus infinity or go to minus infinity. That's the second condition. So the problem that you may encounter here is at this point, right? So here we see some kind of discontinuity going on. So what do we need to do? We have to look at any sequence that converges to x. Okay, so it may come from the left, it may come from the right, it may go back and forward, right? But it has to converge to x. And then if I look at the corresponding y's, okay, so these might be here. If they converge to something, these y's has to converge to something in f of x, which is uh, this part here. Okay, so we see that, for example, if the sequence comes from the left, then obviously it will converge to this point here, right? So this y will be in f of x. Okay, so that's good. If you have a sequence over here and the sequence converges to some y, for example, it converges to this point here, okay, then this point will also be in f of x, so here it's the condition is also satisfied. And I hope you can see that for any y, if either we come from the left or from the right, it's impossible to go to plus or minus infinity because this correspondence is uh, bounded here. So this correspondence is upper hemicontinuous. So let's look at a correspondence which is not upper hemicontinuous. So I'm going to make a small distinction, right? So this is my correspondence, this is my domain. And now it's basically this correspondence, but this these points here are not in my f of x. Okay, so my f of x is only this point here. Okay, so if I now look at my x, does it satisfy the definition of upper hemicontinuity, well, I need that for any sequence that goes to x, for example, a sequence that comes from the right, and any sequence of y that converges, so for example, I take this sequence here, okay, so this sequence converges to this point, the limiting point has to be in f of x, which is here not the case, right, because the boundary is not in the set, okay, so this is not upper hemicontinuous. So we cannot have open fuzzy boundaries, right? So this is not allowed when you have upper hemicontinuity. If you have a line like this that's not included in f of x, so it's like a part of an open set like this, right? So it's fuzzy. This cannot be an upper hemicontinuous correspondence. So let's look at our budget correspondence. 
remember BPM this consists of all the bundles Q and RM plus such that P times Q was less or equal to the income M. And you would like to show that this uh, budget correspondence is upper Hemi continuous. Okay, so what do we need to do? So this is now our X. Okay, these are our X's. This is in the domain. And these are the, our Y's in the definition of upper Hemi continuity. Okay, so what do we have? We have if we, for all sequences, Pn Mn that converge to Pm. Okay, and for all sequences Qn such that for all n Qn is in Bpn Mn. If well, first of all, the second condition says that Qn is bounded. Okay, so this was our condition 2. And condition 1 says that if Qn converges to a limiting bundle Q, then Q has to be in the budget set with price P and income M. Okay, so this is the first condition right so we have a sequence p and mn that converges to some price and income we have an associated sequence of y's right this is here such that for every n qn is in the f but now it's b right of p and mn then the sequence has to be bounded and if the sequence converges then the limit has to be in the limit in the uh, correspondence of uh, this point so we have to check one and two so, in order to show that Qn is bounded, let's first look at the sequence of incomes Mn. So we know that M of N converges to M, right? So this, these two things converge to these two things. So the sequence of incomes converges to M. So we know that this sequence is bounded. Okay, so for example, M of N is smaller than some big number m. Okay, any convergent sequence is a Cauchy sequence, any Cauchy sequence is bounded, so this sequence is bounded uh, from previous results. And now let's let's look at let's take one particular price, right? For example, the jade good. So we see that this converges to the price of good j in this vector. Okay. So, given that it converges to something that's strictly positive, it can not go to zero, right? So there's some lower bound on these prices. Okay, so in particular, if we take the infimum of uh, this sequence P and J, then this infimum has to be strictly positive. Okay. So let's take this infimum P and J to be equal to, uh, let's call this uh, PJ. Okay, and then let's take P to be equal to the minimum over all goods of this number uh, PJ. Okay, so if the price of good J is always uh, strictly bigger than this big P, and if the income is always lower than M, then we know that Q and J is always lower than M over P. Right, and this holds for all n and for all j. So if none of the goods, every number here is bounded, this means that the sequence is bounded. Right? So if you have a sequence of vectors and every element in the vector is bounded, then the vector itself is also bounded. Right? Because q n is equal to the square root of these things q and j squared and if all of these are bounded then this thing will also be bounded okay so this shows that this sequence here is a bounded sequence so in the second thing we need to show that if qn converges to q to some vector q 
then Q was in the budget set of the limiting price with the limiting income. So we can prove this uh, quite easy by using the, the properties of convergent sequences that you already know. So what does it mean? Well, what does it mean? We already have that this is true, right? Every QN uh, is in the budget set, right? This is by definition. So we know that QN is greater or equal to zero. And we also know that if you pre-multiply QN by PN, this is less or equal to MN. Okay. Now QN converges to Q and every element of QN is greater or equal to zero. So by property of inequalities taken to the limit, we have that Q is also greater or equal to zero. Here we have a sequence. We have a sequence of PNs converging to P and QNs converging to Q. And we take the product of all these things. So this will converge to P times Q, simply because this is a continuous function of all prices and all quantities. And now the budgets converge to M. And you can show that if you have two sequences, every element of the first sequence is lower or equal to an element of the second one. And in the limit, this inequality also holds. Okay, and then from this, we derive indeed by definition that Q is in the budget set of that price is P and budget M. Okay, so this is what we needed to show. So this shows that the budget correspondence is upper Hemi continuous. So now we're going to see the second notion of continuity of correspondences, which is called lower Hemi continuity. Okay, so let's take the correspondence as before from some domain to some uh, range. So what do we do? We start almost identically to upper hemicontinuity. So we take any sequence xn in the domain such that xn converges to x. Okay, so we say that f is lower hemicontinuous at the point x if for all sequences in the domain xn converges to x. Else, what else do we need? We need a y in f of x. Okay, so we need the limiting y in f of x, and then the following holds. We need that there exists a sequence y n in the range uh, such that two things happen. Well, y n converges to is y and second there exists an m such that for all n greater or equal to m to this m the y n is an f of xn where here xn is defined as the, the sequence that goes to x okay so we start with the sequence that converges to x and we take a y in the limiting correspondence, right, and the correspondence of this limiting vector, then we should be able to construct a sequence that converges to this y, right, and that from some point onwards every yn is in the correspondence of this corresponding x. Okay, so if this is our domain, here we have an x, and here we have a sequence that converges to this x, and then we look at, for example, this is f of x, right, so we take any y in this correspondence, then we should be able to generate a sequence that converges to this y, such that if this would be f of 
x1 and then you have f of x2 and f of x3 and these y's are in these correspondences right so we have like a sequence that should be able to converge to this y okay so for example this could be the really killing this picture but this could be for example this correspondence so we can always find the sequence of y's okay that converges to to this y that's the notion of uh, lower hemicontinuity okay so the difference with upper hemicontinuity is that with upper hemicontinuity we had a sequence of y's on this side and it had to converge to y and f of x here we start with the y and f of x and we have to construct a sequence that converges to uh, this y so let me give an example of a lower hemicontinuous correspondence so remember from the upper he part on upper hemicontinuity we have seen that this is not upper hemicontinuous however if we take this x and if we take a y and f of x right so f of x is here the single point so this has to be our y that we have here then if we have a sequence to, from the left or a sequence from the right we can always generate corresponding y's that converge here and we can also take y's on this side that also converge to this y okay so the lower hemi continues okay on the other hand as a second example if we take something like this as a correspondence this we have seen is upper hemicontinuous but if you would take an x here then lower hemicontinuity would require that for any sequence that goes to x and any y that i take an f of x and now f of x is this bigger uh, thing here it's not a single point but it's the entire line so for example i can take a y here then if i take a sequence from the left to x then it's impossible for me to take a sequence of y's in the correspondence that converges to this y here okay because i need to make a jump here right so it's impossible to to find a y1 a y2 and so on that converges to this point so this is not lower human continuous okay so this hopefully is a bit more clear what's the distinction between lower hemicontinuity and upper hemicontinuity so let's go back to our example of the budget set so we call the budget set that prices m and income prices p and income m is a set of all bundles in rk plus such that p times q the inner product of p and q is lower or equal to m and you would like to show uh, that this set is uh, lower hemicontinuous. So what do we need to do? We need to show that for all sequences Pn and Mn in, uh, that converge to Pn, Mn, okay, converge to some P and some M. And uh, for all Q in the limiting budget set, so the budget set with uh, the limit here, limit price and limit income, we need to be able to show that there exists a sequence Q ends such that these Q ends converge to Q. So that's the first one. And the second one is that for all n at some point, right? So basically there exists an m such that for all n greater or equal to this m, this qn is in B P N M M. Okay. So basically we need to be able to get a sequence such that every element in sequence is in the corresponding budget and the sequence uh, second converges to this q. So in order to show that we can generate such a Q, we're going to construct one. Okay. So normally lower hemicontinuity, how do you show it? Well, you construct a sequence that satisfies the desired properties. 
Okay, so let's have a look at our limiting budget. Okay, um, so this is our B. Let's not have a look at the limiting budget, but let's have a look at the budget at some price Pn and some income Mn. Okay, and let's assume for first case that Q is in the budget. Okay, so this is case one. Q is in B. P of M. So if Q is in the budget, I need to find the, the Qn that's in budget P and M N that converges to Q. Okay. So ideally, I would like to take a Qn that's as close as possible to Q as I can do it, because if Qn is close to Q, then hopefully I will get uh, towards convergence. If Q is in the budget, I can easily just set Q equal to Qn. Okay. In this case, Qn is already equal to Q, so I hope it will also converge to this Q. I'm already as close as possible that I uh, can be. Okay, so in case one, if Q is in P budget of P and M n, we set Q Q n to be equal to Q. Okay, so this is uh, part of the sequence that you will construct. But of course, there's also the case where we look at the budget B P n M n, right? The budget at uh, position n, but Q is outside. Okay, so here it's impossible to take Qn to be equal to Q because Qn has to be in the in the budget. So how do we do this? Well, there are uh, different ways you can do this. You can try to find the Q that's as close as possible to this Q here, but it's still in the budget, right? So the easiest way to do this, I think, is just to to proportionally decrease Q until it's just hits uh, the budget set and put this equal to to Q in. Okay, so Q in will be equal to a reduction of Q, right? So it will be proportional to Q, but it will have to satisfy uh, the budget constraint. So it needs to satisfy that Pn times Q in is less or equal to Mn. Okay, and I hope you see that Actually, this inequality will be inequality because it will be on the budget line. So it will also satisfy this uh, condition. Okay, so if we replace this by this, then you have that Pn alpha Q is equal to M of N. So alpha will be equal to budget MN divided by Pn times Q. Okay, so case 2, if uh, Q is not in the budget set at Pn Mn, we're going to set Q to be equal to alpha Qn, sorry, to be equal to alpha times Q, and alpha is going to be equal to Mn. So this alpha will change with N, right? So let's use this up uh, index here, Mn divided by Pn times Q. So basically what we're going to do, we cannot set Qn equal to Q, so we're going to set it equal to this number. So we hope that if the budget set here gets close enough to the limiting budget set, the limiting budget set will include Q, so this Qn here will also uh, converge to Q. That's the ID at least. So what can we also notice? We can notice that if uh, Q is not in the budget set, this basically means that Pn times Q is bigger than M. Okay, so in this case, Mn, sorry. So in this case, I will have that 1 is bigger than Mn divided by Pn times, times Q. Okay, so this is how I defined alpha N. So in this case, 2, alpha N will be strictly smaller than 1. Okay, so what can I do in... I have that Qn will be equal to alpha Q, okay, uh, alpha NQ, right, where alpha N is either equal to this, okay, if this is smaller than 1, or it will be equal to 1, right, in this case here, 
if this proportion is uh, bigger than 1. Okay, so alpha n will be equal to mn p and q, or it will be equal to 1 in this case, and it will take the minimum of these two. Okay, so here we can, we basically get rid of case 1 and case 2. We just describe it in general. qn will be proportional to q, and the order of proportionality will be the minimum of this number and 1. Okay, so here alpha n, what will happen to alpha n? Well, alpha n is the minimum of two things. Okay, and the minimum function is continuous. So alpha n for n going to infinity, the 1 converges to 1. This converges to m divided by p times q. So this converges to the minimum of m over p times q and 1. Okay, and what do we know? Well, we know that q is in the budget set, limiting budget set, so p times q is lower or equal to m, or m over p times q is greater or equal to 1. Okay, and if this is greater or equal to 1, then the minimum of the two will be equal to 1. Okay, so alpha n converges to 1, so this here alpha n times q converges to 1 times q, so this converges to q, so my qn indeed converges uh, to q. So this is what I uh, needed to show. Okay, so basically we have constructed a sequence of qn's, setting it equal to q if possible, by minimally contracting q if not possible, and then we show that this we can express it in a general rule by defining alpha n to be equal to this minimum of this number and this. However, this converges to this, one converges to one, so the minimum of these two, because q is in the budget set, will be equal to uh, the second one, which is one, so alpha n converges to one, so alpha n q converges to q, which is what we needed to show. So this shows that the budget set is not only upper hemicontinuous, but also lower hemicontinuous.